I am very, very excited to introduce our next panel. Uh, I want to just tell, take a two, two minutes to tell you about the STML certification. It's a two-year program at the Brooks MPA um, program. It's for Cornell graduate students um, who want to dive more deeply into systemic issues that are faced by policymakers, scientists, leaders, activists, and entrepreneurs. Um, and you know, you probably are knowing that systems thinking is actually one of the most sought after skills of employers and it's a foundational skill in the modern world. So you're about to hear from this year's certificate recipients. First, we'll hear from Natasha Steinhall. And then we will hear from Michelle Parks, and then Mawish Khan, James Bond, and Rebe Rebecca McPettit, all of whom have done excellent work on their research projects. And importantly, and importantly, Derek and I would like you to know, it has been an honor to work with uh, each one of you. Your intellect, your hard work, your engagement has all been remarkable over these last two years. Um, so without for the delay, I'm going to introduce these stellar STML certificate students who are gonna share their in-depth uh, original research that builds off of the amazing work of Dr. James Densley. And what they're looking at is how people think about policy problems and how we can shift their thinking to make more effective policy decisions. So Natasha, I'll hand it to you. Thank you, Laura, for the, that introduction. Um, in our talk today, titled Wicked Solutions for Wicked Problems, Misalignment in Policy Solutions, we will explore the discrepancy between the intricacy of our problems and the complexity of our solutions. We'll analyze the disconnect between the functioning of real world systems and our perception of them. Our focus will be on altering our approach to generate effective outcomes in the policymaking process. Public policy students are trained to address the world's most complex policy challenges. This means understanding the complexity of these challenges and what to do to solve them. This further involves learning the theoretical tools, models, concepts, and frameworks needed to tackle these problems. However, our current approach to tackling these problems is imbalanced and they are overwhelming our tools, models, concepts, and frameworks. Traditionally, the design of research and experiments directs us to study these problems in isolation in order to understand how they function. Then it's simply a matter of selecting the right tools and designing the appropriate framework and policy to solve them. This policy problem is then checked off our list and we move on to the next pressing issue that arises. So if it's that straightforward, how have these complex problems persisted? and why have we not been able to solve them yet? After conducting a comprehensive review of the literature on policy design, we found that there is a general lack of consensus on what constitutes effective policy design and implementation. Our systemic analysis of 59 publications on effective policy found that only four of the 59, or 7%, represented empirical research. The other 55 papers represent non-empirical publications discussing a variety of researchers' perspectives and opinions on what makes an effective policy. There is a lack of empirical evidence and coherence in policy design and implementation. This hinders our ability to design effective policy solutions for complex issues. Different stakeholders, including scholars, politicians, and community members, each holding differing opinions on policy design and implementation, make it difficult to define what effective policy actually means. One researcher describes successful policy implementation as being a better match between the products of civil servants and the expectations of politicians. Another describes successful policy as being evidence-informed in order to reduce the influence of political agendas and other factors on policy implementation. These examples illustrate how a researcher's context impacts their perspective and focus on what makes effective policy. Without a clear definition for success, it's hard to know how to approach policy design. Even expert analyses of policy effectiveness are compartmentalized 
and tend to focus on one aspect of policy development rather than providing a holistic framework for policy design and implementation. This lack of cohesion results in a tendency to attack single elements of complex issues rather than devising and implementing comprehensive solutions. We need a better way to think we need a better way of thinking about policy to address complex problems. Our research has revealed a critical misalignment between the traditional problem-solving approaches that we are taught and the complexities of the real world. It is this misalignment that prevents us from solving today's wicked problems. Wicked problems, as coined in 1973 by design theorists Horace Riddle and Melvin Weber, are systemic and interconnected, making them difficult to define and solve. Unlike traditional problems that have clear solutions, wicked problems require equally complex and systemic solutions that take into account the web of causes. A web of causality describes how multiple factors or variables are interconnected and interact with each other in complex systems, leading to multiple and often unexpected outcomes. In this context, the causes and effects of a problem are not linear or straightforward, but rather they are part of a complex network of relationships and interactions that make it difficult to isolate and solve individual problems without considering their interconnectedness. Understanding webs of causality is critical for developing effective solutions to complex problems. In contrast, our education system teaches us how to study a single variable or relationship in a vacuum. This is held up as the gold standard for discovery and knowledge making. This approach fails to consider the context that these variables must interact with in the real world. Yet, we use this form of knowledge making to inform our policy design and implementation decisions. Our talk today will delve into the mismatch between the complexities of our problems and the solutions we use to address them. We will explore how to shift our thinking to better align with the systemic nature of these problems and achieve more accurate and effective results in the policymaking process. By understanding the complexities of the real world, we can begin to tackle wicked problems with wicked solutions. To do this, we first need to consider the feedback we are getting from reality. Systems thinking is built on the recognition of VUCA, that our reality is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. The world is messy and non-linear. Our biggest challenges have webs of causes rather than a single or root cause. Yet, as humans, we have a tendency to compartmentalize and we fail to account for the true nature of our world, making it difficult to create meaningful change. To navigate this complexity, we need analytical tools that recognize the feedback that reality is constantly giving us. By understanding the systems in which we operate, we can better align our thinking and our actions to create solutions that address the wicked problems we face. This feedback allows us to course correct and change our behavior, our choices, and our approach to solving wicked problems. However, feedback is often misinterpreted and compartmentalized, causing us to isolate specific attributes to solve complex problems instead of seeing the big picture. We seek out linear causal pathways in a non-linear world, missing the fact that all wicked problems exist in webs of causality. It is clear that we need a new approach to solving wicked problems that acknowledges the complexity of the systems we live in. Despite living in a VUCA world, our thinking is often constrained by what researchers Drs. Derek and Laura Cabrera call LAMO. LAMO is linear, anthropocentric, mechanistic, and overly ordered. In linear thinking, we assume a straightforward cause and effect relationship between events. We tend to see problems in a one-dimensional way and focus on the immediate short-term effects of actions rather than considering long-term consequences. We think in bivalent ways, either or, or ra rather than multivalent, both and. When we think anthropocentrically, we are overly focused on a human-centered perspective to the neglect or the exclusion of systems of other systems or forces. In mechanistic thinking, 
we see the world as a machine that can be broken down into a collection of parts and that these parts can be understood and manipulated in predictable ways. Lastly, we think of things in overly ordered and static categories. Lamo thinking prevents us from understanding wicked problems. If we don't understand a wicked problem, we can't create an effective solution. This presents a mismatch with the reality of the problems themselves. In the realm of policy, we isolate an issue and try to solve it through a linear, ordered process, instead of viewing a complex problem and its web of causality. Our research investigates whether people tend to focus on linear causal relationships instead of seeing webs of causality and whether they prefer solutions that are bivalent, tangible, or linear over ones that are multivalent, intangible, and non-linear. Typically, we try to fit problems into neat theories, frameworks, or models, which results in us eliminating key relationships and aspects of how or why that issue exists. Consequently, we only address a part of the problem we defined rather than the full complexity of the problem itself. This approach is rooted in a mindset that centers around the causal relationship of X leading to Y, thereby ignoring all the other variables that contribute to the issue and failing to see the webs of causality. To create effective solutions for wicked problems, we need to move away from lame thinking and embrace a more nuanced and holistic approach that accounts for the complexity of the world we inhabit. We need to understand that webs of causality require webs of solutions. We focused our research on understanding how people think about wicked problems and how this impacts their ability to recognize and understand the efficacy of different solutions. Building off of prior work on the greatest crises we face and the conclusion that we are facing a crisis of cognition, we conducted two surveys to understand how people are thinking about crises today and their solutions. The first survey asked participants to identify the most important crisis humanity currently faces, its primary cause, and who is primarily responsible for solving it. We asked people what is the most important crisis humanity is facing. This figure illustrates the top 50 words from people's responses to this open-ended question. Participants were then asked to identify the primary cause of most important crisis. As you can see, many people's responses to this question included humans as an element of the primary cause. This figure represents the top 50 words from people's responses to this question. We also wanted to know who people consider to be primarily responsible for solving this crisis. Participants were presented with a list of agents ranging from churches, schools, nonprofit organizations, individuals, and local, state, and national governments. You can see in this slide, in this figure that national, state, and local governments were identified as bearing the most responsibility. We found it interesting that although people are identifying humans as the primary cause of our crisis, they're looking to governing institutions to solve these crises. Respondents look to a singular entity to solve these wicked problems, yet the solutions are complex and require a multifaceted approach at individual, institutional, and societal levels. The second survey built off the first and was designed to understand how people think about solutions to wicked problems. In other words, we tested when presented with an evidence-based web of solutions, do people understand that the whole is more than the sum of its parts? and that all of the solutions need to be implemented to be effective. These kinds of problems can't be addressed if we only implement one solution at a time, decide it isn't effective, and move on to the next one. Doctors Gillian Peterson and James Densley, who we just heard from in the previous session, have compiled the largest and most comprehensive database in the United States, 
on the life histories of mass shooters. In their book, The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic, they provide an evidence-based web of solutions to address the persistent issue of mass shootings in the US. Frustrated by the reactionary policy conversations that have yet to solve the problem, the Violence Project provides an evidence-based solutions to take a more proactive approach to addressing mass shootings. Mass shootings are a wicked problem based on a web of causality. Therefore, to begin to address the issue of mass shootings, we need to design a web of solutions. In their book, Drs. Peterson and Dainsley present 12 recommendations to address the issue of mass shootings at three levels across four different areas. Those levels are individuals, institutional, societal. The areas are trauma, crisis, social proof, and opportunity. Together, these 12 solutions represent what we all can do to stop the mass shootings epidemic. Our second survey used the Violence Project's recommendations to assess how people respond when presented with an evidence-based web of solutions. So we surveyed over 400 people and asked, how effective do you think each of these solutions would be in solving the issue of mass shootings? So the responses were on a Likert scale, and then we aggregated and analyzed them for trends. So people think about these problems as we expected. They failed to see the need of web of solutions and migrated towards only a few recommendations as being the most effective. So what's unique about the Violence Project's 12 solutions is that they present a set of empirically based solutions that incorporate a multi-level approach. So in an interview that we had had with uh, Dr. Densley, who spoke earlier, he stated that you have to do all of them if you want to truly address all aspects of the problem. Listing them in order wouldn't necessarily work because these things are all happening simultaneously and they're interconnected and intertwined now. And this is something that if you listened to his talk previously, he also stated. So this is a true web of solutions approach. However, when these solutions were presented to a sample that was generalizable to the U.S. population, we found that people are not on the same page about how to solve this problem. If people understood complexity and wicked problems, if they fought against our inherent way of lame thinking, then we would expect them to consistently rate all of the 12 solutions as equally effective. However, not a single person out of all 413 respondents did this. So this is important because as we hypothesize that the majority of the general public are not systems thinkers. Therefore, we do not expect them to rate all the solutions as highly effective. Because systems thinkers would understand that all of these solutions are both critical and necessary to address the wicked problem. So instead, we see that people's perceptions of these solutions ranged from those who thought a majority of the solutions would be moderately effective to those who thought that most of the solutions would be largely ineffective and everything in between. So this figure shows the distribution of respondents based on how they rated the efficacy of each of the solutions presented. And as you can see, there is no general consensus among the respondents. So if solutions based on the largest data set in the United States tell us what to do and we don't listen, then we're thinking about this problem in the wrong way. This highlights the misalignment between how people exist in the real world and how we think about them. So this is an ongoing crisis of cognition. So factor analysis of these 12 recommendations revealed three distinct factors or patterns. So looking at these factors, we identified the following themes across the related solutions. First, firearms and regulation. Second, media. And third, community and mental health. It's the presence of these factors that illustrates the bivalent or linear thinking that people have a tendency to see certain types of solutions as more or less effective than other types of solutions. What we see is that respondents answered solutions that addressed firearms and regulations similarly. They answered the solutions that address media in a similar pattern, and they responded to solutions that addressed community and mental health with a similar rating. 
Since people rated solutions according to their perception of the efficacy of each solution, we have people who consider firearms and regulations as the root cause of mass violence. We have others who consider media as the root cause, and we have others who consider community and mental health as a root cause. This does not mean that respondents rated these factors as the only cause, as patterns vary within each, of per each person's response. The main takeaway from this example is not what people think about each of these factors, but instead it's the patterns in how people are thinking. While people have different opinions on what is the root cause of mass shootings, we see a common tendency to think in a binary, either or way, focusing on identifying a single cause rather than recognizing a web of solutions. This is what Derek was hitting at at the end of the conversation with Dr. Densley. But in our research, we found that the way we think about problems is wrong. And that thinking leads to ineffective policy that is misaligned with its desired outcomes. We approach a complex problem and try to determine the single root cause of its existence and address that cause. We utilize a framework to create a neat problem so we can innovate a neat solution but we ignore the VUCA-ness of reality. Complex, wicked problems have a web of causality. Therefore, we need a web of solutions. Unfortunately, even when presented with a web of solutions, we want to pick and prioritize our approach. This does not work. Implementing one of these solutions will be unsuccessful if it's not concurrently applied with the other 11 solutions. We need a web of solutions to address a problem involving a web of causes. This is one of the problems we face in policy. We solve our neat problem with a neat solution that addresses the root cause, and we wonder why it doesn't work. Even worse, we take it as far as throwing out that solution because we think it was bad or wrong, when in reality, it is a good solution, but we fail to concurrently apply the other solutions. So based on these findings, we propose the following. First, we need to redefine wicked problems. Now, this is a depiction of the system's thinking loop through a policy lens, where we view reality, apply an intervention through policies, receive feedback on how it works or doesn't, and make adjustments accordingly. Now, that's ideal, um, where we're constantly taking in feedback and adjusting our approach. But people tend to fixate and become overwhelmed by the wicked problem itself and we look for its root causes instead of recognizing the mismatch between our mental model and reality. Not only that, but we fall into patterns of thinking where we're biased towards immediate binary solutions instead of looking for a multitude of causes. We need to see the existence of wicked problems as feedback that our mental model is wrong. This recognition shifts our lens and presents us with an exciting opportunity. We can now completely reframe how we approach the wicked problems that we've been attacking with narrow policy scopes for years with little to no effect. Wicked problems are feedback, an outcome of reality's complex issues. And if we do not recognize and make adjustments for how we are viewing reality and designing policy, then the outcomes won't change. Second, we need to understand that a web of causality needs a web of solutions. We need to move away from single solutions and root causes to a web of solutions that are implemented concurrently. When we get stuck in lame thinking patterns, we try to examine things in isolation. We design and implement one solution, and when it doesn't work, we say, well, this must not be the right answer, and we move on to a new isolated attempt. What we need to be doing is taking a yes and approach looking for multiple solutions and figuring out how can we implement these together. As long as we continue to convince ourselves that attacking just one element at a time is the only way that policy can effectively operate, problems will persist and policies will continue to be ineffective. When presented with a web of solutions, we have to work against, or as we like to say, think against our desire to pick choose, prioritize our approaches. And when we're working on policy that only attacks one element of a problem, we need to ask ourselves, will this be enough? So how do we promote this? Well, we need to educate policy students in systems thinking. However, 
only three schools out of the top 40 in the United States that have a public policy program offer a course in systems thinking. In some cases, it's not even a full course within the program, just an introduction. As discussed, the wicked problems we face in a VUCA world cannot be solved through policy approaches rooted in LAMO thinking. Why are we trying to apply singular solutions to these problems that are demonstratedly complex and difficult to even figure out, let alone solve? Even more importantly, why are we continuing to educate policy students to think this way? Our research shows that people are thinking about problems, solutions, and thus policy the wrong way. So we need to change our thinking. We change policy through teaching people to be systems thinkers and approaching wicked problems holistically and with a mindset that thinks webs of solutions versus one at a time solutions. So where do we go from here? Well, we need to minimize the mismatch of our mental model of reality and reality itself. We do this by first recognizing wicked problems as feedback from reality. We then need to think systemically about the wicked problems by not isolating and simplifying problems. We need to understand that wicked problems have a web of causality and they require a web of solutions. So in summary, we've seen that there is no agreed upon definition of effective public policy which poses a big challenge for addressing these complex, wicked problems. We don't have a clear framework or basis to use when addressing the world's wicked problems. Our research highlighted that people's tendency to think in linear cause and effect relationships leads to misaligned and ineffective policies. To overcome this crisis of cognition, we must learn to see webs of causality in order to create webs of solutions. Only then can we hope to make progress in solving wicked problems. Thank you. Great job. Great job. Yes. Well, we have a lot of questions. A lot coming of questions. In, coming as in. we expected. Yeah. So I want to start just a little bit of background. I mean, you guys did a lot of pretty high level statistics, uh, K means clustering, hierarchical clustering, and you did factor analysis. Um, but what fundamentally you found with the factor analysis was that people kind of were bifurcating and linear in the causality of things, right? I mean, uh, Dr. Densley actually talked about it. It's, it's either mental health or it's guns. It's not both. It's either or. And what you did was find that quantitatively. So talk a little bit about what you found that. Um, you know, that maybe we didn't expect from the data uh, around, you know, what what I think experts like Dr. Densley kind of knew that this is the case, but we found it in, in the data that, that you guys analyzed. Um, I think speaking for me personally, one thing that I was kind of assuming or expecting to see were more demographic trends. Um, do people think about this um, one way based on their gender, based on their political affiliations, based on race, based on education level? Um, and I, I think we didn't quite see that in the way that we were expecting. And um, there was just generally great variation across demographics. Um, James, do you wanna add to that? Yeah, uh, it was actually pretty interesting because the way we started this, uh, as you know, uh, Derek and Laura is we went into it wanting to see how people think and really try to determine kind of like what are what describes a systems thinker what are these things but as you're going through there's really nothing that differentiates somebody in terms of as Natasha said demographics but what emerged out of that uh, as you said through the factor analysis was actually the way people think is oriented in what they believe about certain things and it was really interesting because then when we look at that, we can see how their responses to these tall solutions then basically channeled their uh, thought process of like, hey, these are actually going to be really effective. And yeah, you still have to do these other things. There wasn't anybody who was completely polarized, but like, yeah, do this one mostly. And yeah, you can sprinkle in some of the others. And that was actually really interesting to see that as we started looking at the responses. That's excellent. 
Yeah, it's interesting. I, I think, you know, looking at how people think, a, a lot of times I think what, what we would generally think of is, is that a politician or uh, creates a, a policy or, or, or something like that, right? And a policy solution. And there's this politician behavior and we get frustrated with that politician behavior. But there's something that happens before the politician behavior, which is the way that all the people in the country are thinking. And so what we really wanted to do was find out, well, how are they thinking, right? Because that's obviously going to influence the politician's behavior, which is going to influence the policy solution that's chosen, right? Yeah. I mean, the other thing I, I wanted to build off what Natasha was saying, I didn't want to gloss over the demographics thing. Yeah. So maybe you could speak a little bit more about we actually expected to learn to see a lot more similarity demographically in the people who said one thing versus the other, but talk about that that wasn't the case and what the implications are for that. Yeah, I think um, it's it's something we're we're still grappling with, right? Like what what does that mean when um, the way that we're talking about this in society and media, is that our country is so polarized right now that people do think that it's either guns or it's or it's mental health. Um, I thought one thing that was interesting in looking at the survey data was that um, a lot of people would say guns and a lot of people would say mental health. And then there was also this other group that said um, that would explicitly mention both um, in like describing how they were thinking about the issue. Um, another thing that I saw even in coming in in the Q&A this morning as um, Dr. Densley was talking was um, as we're talking about how important all of the solutions are, still seeing questions focusing like on very specific, but what about the gun policy? What about this part? Um, so I think there's still uh, so much that we can um, explore within our data, and that's really exciting um, and interesting to think about. Um, and for me, like it, it challenged a lot of my assumptions that, you know, I expected that we would see certain patterns and, and we didn't. Yes. Yeah. That's a really good point. I, I love that you made that point. Cause I'd noticed the same thing. And even in the chat and the Q and a that, and you, I think you'd see this with any, any group of people. I mean, that's what your research shows essentially is, you know, uh, you're going to focus on what you think is the issue. So you've already decided what the issue is, and you're going to focus on that, and you're going to ask questions about that. But what if we actually said, well, the data tells us that the, that all of this is the issue. Yeah. And so let's focus on all of this. Let's not part and parcel it out. Uh, yeah. so. Also, I was thinking um, a lot of people in, in the Q&A from the audience, Rebecca, maybe you can speak into this because you talked about um, the way we think about solutions and the way we think about like the issue of language, the way that we language things, um, you know, when we call something a problem and we think it has to be a solution, like just talk a little bit about how language has, has impacted this issue. And then also how you all sort of challenge that notion of, you know, problem solving being maybe the first bias in the, you know, from the, from the get-go. Yeah, absolutely. I think we saw this from the very beginning when we were looking to try and even define what an effective policy meant. Um, this leads to politicians feeling the need, Dr. Densley touched on this a little bit, to have that success. And that success needs to be shown in some kind of binary way um, versus potentially it's the prevention of something. And no one's ever going to know that it happened. So we start right there with the definitional issue with success, and then we lead into problems, and then the webs of solutions. Um, I think like the solving definitional issue is something too, where it's like we are looking to solve wicked problems, but we took it a step back and we said we can't, if we consider them as feedback, then we have to look even farther behind it. I really enjoyed when we put together like the systems thinking loop and literally put the little tangled web right there as the feedback helped cement for me. Um, definitely a lot of just like completely flipping how we think about these really persistent, challenging issues um, that we don't have the answers for yet. But if we can, if we can attack them in a different way, um, isn't it time to do that at this point? I think sometimes coming up with these um, with this kind of presentation too, you think that maybe we do we should come up with the whole list of solutions for it. But really, we're just saying let's 
let's consider that we've been thinking about it incorrectly this whole time. Let's flip the definition and see what shakes up, see what comes out from that and see how much more successful we can be. Um, just with seeing with trying like different things and seeing how they can uh, compile together. Yeah, I, I really want to underline that because um, that that little loop with the with the hairball on it, because, it, it, you know, if, when we think about mass killings, we we do what we do with most crises or wicked problems. Right. We, we say, well, this is a thing that we don't like. So let's fix it. Let's solve it. Let's get rid of it. It shouldn't be this way. But what if we said mass killings is reality giving us feedback. It's society giving us feedback that our mental models about society, not about mass killings, about society are wrong. Yeah. We're thinking about it the wrong way. Yeah. And I think prisons are giving us feedback. I think our mental health or lack of mental health system is giving us feedback. All of these wicked problems are feedback. It's such an important idea that, you, that you're putting out. So I just want to like put a... Yeah put an exclamation mark on it. Uh, yeah. And, and the other thing that I'm seeing that you, you mentioned sort of in passing, but I think people are picking up on in the Q and A is you talked about the education of policy students and how that could change. Maybe Mawish or Michelle, you could speak into that. And there's, there's some, some talk in the Q and A about, well, which is, which is the problem? Is it the way that we're educating policy students which leads to the way we think about policy, or is it that the way that we think about policy is causing the way we just talk about that a little bit more? People are wondering about that. Um, so I would say that I think a great thing about systems thinking is that it gives you principles and tools to really just slow down and think. And how often do we actually slow down and we're like, okay, these are the framework and this is how we're thinking. And it can really help you make sense of things in a way more um, concrete way, I guess, because you're taking perspective and you're following the DSRP rules to make distinctions, see the systems, relationships and perspectives. And so you can go really into something and like out. And I think that that's something that we talk about, we say that these different systems are interacting and affecting things, but then we don't have the tools to actually figure out like how those interactions are working. And that's why I love systems thinking so much is because I feel mm -hmm. like I have the tools, um, which I think, I feel like I provide really great papers. <laughs> 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 because I'm making, I'm just applying DSRP without even realizing it at this point, because I've been immersed in this program for so long. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And Mawish, you know, you, you came here having already worked many years in governmental organizations. I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the contrast between sort of that world and then coming into this kind of an approach to things. Um, I, I would... I would only say that system thinking helps in unlocking layers of a system. And when we unlock each layer, we understand where the problem is and how it can be dealt in that particular department. However, that, that does not mean that it can be done in isolation. And this is primarily why I consider that system thinking should be taught in a very it should be should be you know taught from the basic level because it teaches you how different things coordinate and how think different things have relationship with each other and i think as future policy makers if we are not giving the education on systems thinking we are actually ignoring the major factor or the major major avenue where we can think that, okay, this is one department and this has an influence on the other one. And if this one is ignored, this will not be able, will not be able to have a very good or the right impact on the overall scale. And yes, I have worked in um, Pakistan. Um, I have interacted with the government departments while I was working with the private sector. And most of the time I saw that there was a very uh, disconnect in the policies and the rules and regulations were, and every department had their own rules and regulations, ignoring the fact that they are not in, they are not aligned with the other. And this was actually creating a disruption in the entire system. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, system thinking is, is, a, is a big thing. And I think 
every level of education should have that introduction, at least an introduction to system thinking so that people can actually understand how to unlock each layer, how to unlock the system and understand where the problem lies and how we can connect it to the right um, feedback and the reality. Yes. Well, so we have a, a something from C Seymour uh, on on the Q and A. He said, uh, "What great students! I couldn't agree with uh, with him more. Uh, you guys have been fantastic. Your project is really uh, just fantastic, and uh, we appreciate all the work and uh, that you put into it." Oh, and we have a raise. Oh yes, from we would love to hear from yes, Doctor Densley. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just. I apologize. I'm in a different location now. <laughs> I'm in a car. That was the best commute I've ever done, though. Um, I'm, meet, I'm actually meeting with a high school principal in about uh, 15 minutes time because there was a shooting at a school here in the Twin Cities. Um, and um, we're doing some research at the moment around gun violence um, in schools. So um, hence, I'm in the car. But I listened to the entire presentation. It was the best commute I've had in a long time. And um, I just want to say, I want to echo what one of the people just said, which is, wow, what an incredible group of students. That was in incredible. And then secondly, my question, well, again, I I'll say another thing, which is thank you for doing this, because um, it's incredible as an academic, uh, as a human being, when people pick up on your work and take it to the next level. And it's actually quite rare when people do that. The vast majority of work you do in academia gets buried in a journal and no one reads it. And you wonder to yourself, is it worth it? And when you have these experiences where groups of really smart people take your work and then elevate it, and and rethink about it and just do the work you've been doing. I just want to really applaud that. I'm actually very touched that this is even a project. But my um, my question for you all is, what are your plans next with the information that you have gathered? Because this to me feels like it should be a published paper. It should, uh, and it should be the foundation for maybe some ongoing work as well. And so that would just be my question to the group. I, uh, I just think you did some excellent work there. So thank you. I can, well, we are publishing a paper. Yes. So all that to say it is, this is the very tip of the iceberg of the paper. Um, there's so much more amazing data analysis in there, um, a lot more information about just like the different definitions of effectiveness we found. Um, so yes, and I believe the Cabreras will definitely send everyone um, that attends the conference information on when that is published and available. Um, but yeah, we are very excited to kind of like solidify and bring it all together in that more extensive way. Um, and then see, I mean, obviously the Cabreras work with amazing different cohorts of students. I know they have another one coming through. So we'll see if maybe they're interested in taking up the uh, the research as well. I don't know if anyone else wants to hit on that. Well, I, I would just add, if and when it is published, peer review is, you know, it takes a while. Yes. Uh, and uh, there's lots of uh, hoops to jump through. But we, we will be delighted to uh, promote it, uh, to talk about it, to use it. Um, it, it will certainly, um, I think it will really inform a lot of the work we're doing at the Violence Project. And so uh, we're very, very grateful for, for the work you're doing. Thank you. Mm, thank you for that. That I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like proud mom. Of, you're right. They're amazing students and they've done amazing work built off of your amazing work. So we will make sure that it does not sit on a shelf and we'll follow up and make sure it's published and Maybe we can figure out how to keep expanding this and going deeper and deeper into how we can really think differently about these things. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I guess there's just more than one crisis. There's more than one wicked problem. You know, there's so many of them. And, and, uh, and I think so, you know, the work you've done 
is amazing, Dr. Densley, that, uh, you know, is, is hitting on this one problem that does have all these, you know, interconnected webs to other problems for sure. But we have to be able to do this for so many problems. There are so many problems we face. And so we, we really need to look at the underlying structure of the way we go about solving problems and how we're thinking when we solve problems and, and how the populace is thinking because the populace is driving the problems and fixing the problems and allowing the problems to be fixed or not fixed. So, uh, you know, it is a very complex system, but I think we have to take kind of a meta a meta view um, before Facebook ruined the term, uh, a, a meta view of, of, of these things and look at how we structure problems, how we structure solutions, how we structure, you know, our, our human thinking and our policies. So, yeah, but we've got a head start yes. with your work in this issue. So perhaps this could be the case yeah. that we can then apply to all the other problems. So we'll take it. Great job, everybody. Yeah. Thank you so much. Very proud of you. Very, very proud of you.